Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Reducing financial anxiety for people is extremely important for everyone. Today's environment you know, particularly highlights that. Having a bank account can do a lot to give people peace of mind that their money is safe and they have a way to access it when they need it without having to pay those higher fees to alternative financial providers. That was Elena Whistler, the SVP of Sales and Relationship Management at The Clearinghouse, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. This is our first episode in Financial Inclusion Month. Every year, we dedicate one month to financial inclusion. My goal is to highlight and bring awareness to what the payments and or fintech industry does today to help with this global challenge, as well as discuss what more we need to do. The Clearinghouse is a banking association and payments company that is governed by about 23 of the largest financial institutions in the United States. They move money through wires, ACH, and check images, and maybe are most known for their RTP network, which is the nation's newest payment system that provides instant clearing and settlement of payments here in the United States. Elena and I go on to talk about some of the challenges that the underbanked and unbanked face, how important it is to bring these segments of the population into the financial system, and how companies and other organizations are leveraging the real-time payments network. We go deep on the importance of earned wage access for both the employee and the employer. This is a vital program that can help the underserved community and is becoming more and more popular. Before we dive into the episode, I want to give a special thanks to The Clearinghouse for sponsoring Financial Inclusion Month. To learn more about The Clearinghouse, just visit www.theclearinghouse.org. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Elena. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. And more specifically, thank you for being here during Financial Inclusion Month. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. So this is kind of a three-part question. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your role, and what The Clearinghouse does. Yes, of course. Absolutely. And I, I'll, maybe I'll go in a little different order. So <laughs> first and foremost about The Clearinghouse, just because I find it so fascinating as part of the payments ecosystem here in the U.S., The Clearinghouse is a banking association and a payments company. So we're governed by about 23 of the largest financial institutions here in the U.S. And we are the nation's most experienced payments company. Believe it or not, was actually founded back in 1853. We operate payments networks that clear and settle more than $2 trillion each day through wires, ACH, check image, and also real-time payments. And we have a long track record of providing secure and reliable systems, payment innovation, strategic thought leadership to financial institutions. We work very closely with industry regulators and associations to facilitate proper dialogue amongst our industry, ultimately representing our clients' needs and visions. And most recently, the Clearinghouse modernized the U.S. payments infrastructure with the RTP network which is the nation's newest payment system that provides instant clearing and settlement of payments here in the U.S. So we have a lot going on, and we continue to focus on ensuring our networks and the U.S. payments industry remains secure and safe, particularly as volume grows on each of our networks. Now, my role at the Clearinghouse is to oversee industry engagement, which includes business development, relationship management, and marketing. And our teams are ultimately responsible for outreach to clearinghouse clients and prospects, helping to grow participation among U.S. financial institutions and evolving our customer engagement and marketing models for all of our products here at the clearinghouse. Now, a little bit about myself. I have a bit of an international background from being born in Canada to family in Uruguay in South America and now living in Columbus, Ohio. I have two girls and in general love to run. So I'm training for the New York Marathon right now, which is in about four weeks. And what brought me into payments, maybe I'll I'll talk for a second about education. Uh, So my education was in economics and international studies. And 
I spent a lot of time researching dollarization in Latin America and the value of microfinance institutions for economic growth and stability. So what I found fascinating was the impact of financial stability for wellness and growth, which I think we'll talk about today. Okay, great. And for those of you listeners who have listened for a while, you will recognize Elena because she was on the show last year around this time as well. So I should welcome you back to the show as well. That's right. Yeah. Happy to be back. Awesome. Great. I I appreciate you explaining all of that and giving us a little background about the company and your role and a little bit about yourself. But to set the stage for the audience, when you hear the words financial inclusion, what does that term mean to you and to the clearinghouse? Yeah, I think the term financial inclusion probably means the same thing to me as it does to the clearinghouse in general. When I think of financial inclusion, I think of providing access to the banking system to individuals who currently don't have it. And more importantly, perhaps when I hear financial inclusion, I think of the things that are not possible without that access. So without a bank account, the unbanked having a difficult time simply to receive a payment or make a payment, manage their bills or their budget. And they often have to rely on alternative financial products and services, which can be more costly. They also have trouble establishing credit, which is extremely important if someone wants to get a loan for a car or house. And it adds financial stress to individuals who often have a lot of financial stressors to begin with. Um, So further exacerbating their, their situation. For the clearinghouse, which works closely with our governing banks and many other financial institutions, financial inclusion and access to the banking system is an important priority and is a shared goal of the private, nonprofit, and government sectors. We do see firsthand that bank accounts also allow individuals to receive government benefit payments quickly, such as the economic impact payments made by the federal government during the pandemic, as well as child tax credits. And having access to products and services offered by financial institution also allows households to avoid more costly alternative financial products and services that I mentioned previously, as well as building wealth. So that's a bit of a definition or roundup. Okay. Well, what would you say are the biggest challenges that the unbanked and underbanked face? Yeah, that's a great question. Last year, we actually, along with five other banking and credit union organizations, we conducted and released a paper that outlined this topic. So talking about the challenges of the unbanked and underbanked. The paper is called Delivering Financial Products and Services to the Unbanked and Underbanked in the United States, so Challenges and Opportunities. It's available on our website. Feel free for anyone to go reach out to it at theclearinghouse.org. So what the paper outlines is a number of ideas of those challenges. So the perception or reality that they don't have enough money to meet the minimum balance requirements, the challenge to trust financial institutions in general. So either coming from another area or another country. So that challenge of trust. And then the barriers with proper identification, perhaps languages, or even reachability. So talking about being disconnected from mainstream systems, including the internet. So what I think we can all agree is there's no single reason, right, for households and individuals to be unbanked. And we can't really address all of them with one large initiative. And we think that more targeted approaches for the varying situations, be it trust or education or access or what tends to be most successful. And you've talked about this a lot as having, you know, having a bank account. And the thought is that that's key, right? So just them having access and it ultimately creates these opportunities. I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, of course. You know, we do think that having a bank account is key. And and mainly because not having a bank account produces additional, we think, additional financial burdens, such as higher fees and interest rates. So it's we go back to the heart of having a bank account. Reducing financial anxiety for people is extremely important for everyone. Today's environment, you know, particularly highlights that Having a bank account can do a lot to give people peace of mind that their money is safe and they have a way to access it when they need it without having to pay those higher fees to alternative financial providers. 
just an, an example in the paper that I mentioned, it outlines some recent legislative proposals such as Fed accounts and digital dollar wallets. They're aimed at addressing the unbanked challenge, which could fail. It could be successful if it significantly, you know, considers the root cause of the problems and the challenges I mentioned. So having access, having internet access, having digital identity, for example, is one potential option. So to us, it just goes back to the heart of having that bank account. Yeah. And just thinking about what's happened in the last what week or two with the hurricane, just thinking about whether it might be government assistance or insurance payouts, you know, I mean, I don't know what people would do if they don't have a bank account. That's right. And having a bank account and having digital access to that bank account is critical for those emergency situations um, that people are are moving and, and transporting themselves to be safe when they need those funds immediately. Right, right. Well, with a bank account and access to the real-time payments network, Earned wage access is a solution that, you know, I think can help the unbanked and underbanked. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But what are some of the other products, programs and solutions that the banking industry is providing to the underbanked and unbanked? Yeah. So I will echo what you said. Payments in general, money movement in and out of bank accounts is an important aspect to having access to banking services. And we'll talk about earned wage access in a second and how that's helpful Another example kind of in parallel to payments processing would be a program called Bank On. So Bank On is a very successful organization and its goals are to ensure that everyone has access to safe and affordable bank or credit union account. So what it does, it, it looks at certain prerequisites related to the bank account and requirements. So it talks about Bank On certified accounts. These are low or no fee accounts that come with debit cards, free or reduced fee ATM access, $25 or less minimum account opening deposit and more. So those characteristics are really what Bank On is focused on. And more than 100 financial institutions covering over 50% of the bank account share market offers these types of services today. So again, important for disaster recovery scenarios where they need access to their funds or safe, secure funds as a they are in safe locations or just in general, like living day to day, needing to manage your money with free or reduced fee account. I think one other point I want to reiterate, because I think it's very important and you mentioned it, is the fact that it's not just helping these people manage money and having a bank account. It's often, at least in my opinion, as important to keep them away from the high fees and the predatory lenders and the the things like that that can, mm -hmm. in the long run, really really hurt their financial wellness. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're with with access to the financial system and having the bank accounts. It's having your funds available when you need it and your wages. And I know we'll talk about that, but having that and not having to rely on more costly ways to do the same thing with your money and with your payments. So that's that's absolutely right. Right. Okay. So we're going to dive into the earned wage access part now. And you, you recently wrote a blog in, in August titled How Earned Wage Access Will Help Employers Through the Big Quit. So can you connect the dots between earned wage access, the RTP network and the clearinghouse kind of pull all that together for us? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. And, you know, I'm really excited to see this movement going forward as we look at how many moves here in the country at the Clearinghouse, we are very focused on ensuring that the banking industry has access to the RTP network, which is the network we provide. And, and I mentioned we launched actually almost five years ago, and it facilitates the movement of money in a faster way. And so if we think about that, the RTP network enables real-time posting. It allows all federally insured U.S depository financial institutions access to the network. So they're eligible and incurred to participate. And the heart of this network is to facilitate that real-time transaction activity to and from bank accounts here in the U.S. So that's what the Clearinghouse is very focused on. And what we've seen in the industry is a transformation of how people are getting paid. So how businesses, small and large, are beginning to look at their employee base and determine how best to pay them 
based upon the activity that they have. The real-time payments on the RTP network is available for consumers and small businesses and, and large corporates. And we move money 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with immediate confirmation that the payment is sent and received and posted. And I say all this because it kind of gives the, the backdrop to when you think about people getting paid in today's environment for the work that they've done, they want to get paid when they did the work. We have a traditional cycle, a payroll cycle, which works just fine for certain industries, but for others, particularly for contractors, for you know seasonal workers, for other activities, they might need to get paid and should get paid when they did their work and their function. And so the term earned wage access is very much to facilitate people getting paid for the work they did and they are able to, you know, pull those funds when they need to pull it. And and it puts the control, if you think about it, on the employees so they can budget their finances a, even a little bit tighter. So we we, you know, have the term traditionally living paycheck to paycheck. And that is because of the payroll cycle. Well, can we flip it on its head and say, you have access to your funds when you need it so you can pay in smaller increments the bills that you need to pay? So we do see that revolution or the evolution on payroll, payroll on demand, sometimes people say, and, and particularly, you know, the gig economy that is managing more on a contractor payouts. We see that growing significantly on the RTP network today. So companies such as Paychex, Daily Pay, Digit, Venmo, PayPal, even, you know, wallets and rideshare providers such as Grubhub and, and others, they are allowing their employees to pull their payroll, their earned wages when they need it. So we see that and we see that high volume growth on the RTP network which to me is exciting because that's not originally what the RTP network was designed for back five years ago or more, but is now in a growing volume base. In part, I think, you know, the pandemic made that happen. People needed their funds more readily and the payroll providers are making that available, which I think is really exciting. And I think to flip that, the employers are using if they offer this, they, the earned wage access, they're using it as a value prop, right? As a reason to work there. Oh, absolutely. So it, to me, it's an additional benefit to working at certain companies that they have the flexibility of earned wage access or, or on-demand payroll as a way to entice their employees to stay or to get in new talent. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think in your blog, you had quoted a report that said, Today, 10% of the companies, and I, I assume it was U.S.-based, offer it today, but they see that going to 20%. That's right. So that, that's a huge growth in, the, you know, in a short amount of time. That's right. Well, do you think you know, this current environment that we're in, this current economic environment, high inflation, increasing interest rates, all those things, do you think in any way it's helping or hurting the unbanked and the underserved in the U.S.? Yeah, I generally think higher interest rates and inflation hurt the underbanked and underserved communities. You know, I just saw a survey published by the American Psychiatric Association that stated that financial worries due to rising inflation is the top stressor in this country today. And around 87% of Americans are specifically worried about inflation and 65% responded. They were stressed about money and the economy. So if we focus on the underbanked and underserved, a higher inflation certainly makes it harder to meet day-to-day financial obligations people have. This is why I think one, you know, one area why earned wage access is so important in the current economic environment. And EWA over the RTP network helps to get those earned wages into the people's hands instantly. So in the environment that we need more money to do the same things, just having access for your everyday expenses rather than waiting for a paycheck later in the week of the month is critical in today's environment. Yeah, absolutely. So 
how do you think we as a as an industry payments fintech if you want to lump those two together you know how do we do more to bring the unbanked and in, into the financial system i mean that's what we've been talking about is, is getting them into the system with the bank account so mm-hmm. what more do we need to do to bring them into the financial system yeah i think we have an opportunity to do more at a, at a few different levels particularly with the underbanked as well as small businesses actually these are segments of the population that aren't utilizing the banking system as effectively and efficiently as they can. So fintech providers, payment providers, along with financial institutions have an opportunity here. So let me just hone in on small business for a minute. They Small businesses account for 44% of the U.S. economic activity. That was from a small business association study back a couple of years ago. And it's clear by that statistic that small businesses are at the heart of the U.S. economy. And most of these small businesses are very small businesses, so very few employees, one to five. And I can say that because as we think about what we need to do to bring people into the financial system and using the financial system, a lot of these people own or are part of a business, right, to help our economic growth and and recovery. So to me, they're, they're tied together. And so the payments industry with financial institutions and the fintech providers, they have that role in this space. I think talking about access to financial services, making digital online banking easier, maybe through technology, maybe through APIs, maybe through embedded banking and changing the digital experience will reduce one of the barriers of entry related to either trust or related to access in general. And we can start to see streamlining financial products for these underserved communities and businesses. Okay. Well, we've been talking a lot about what's happening now or today. What do you think is next? What's coming down the pipe that's going to help? For us at the Clearinghouse, where payments is our focus, we will continue to focus on encouraging the financial services industry to use safe and efficient ways and secure ways, obviously, to move money. We recently launched a few value-added services to help that. So around tokenizing account numbers for bank money movement, as well as providing a mechanism to store documents for businesses to exchange These are just two examples of ways that we look to drive innovation in the banking space and to help these communities feel safe and secure as they're transacting either from a small business perspective or from an individual perspective. So for the underserved, we really want to bring the banking industry to provide these money movement services easily and effectively. We think the RTP network, as an example, is a great way to provide immediate funds availability for any type of transaction, immediate confirmation, just that experience of knowing that your money is there and available reaches one of the challenges of trust. That's what we look to continue to do, you know, in the near term. Well, we've covered a lot of ground so far. And as we wrap up the show, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go? Yeah, I think I'd love to reinforce the fact that the products and services that the Clearinghouse offers, so the, the ACH network, wires, check image, and the real-time payment network, they're available to the entire banking industry. So all financial institutions have the ability and option to connect to our networks and services. And also, we have a, a particular mission and initiative to ensure that minority deposit institutions have access to our networks. And so we're working closely with them to make onboarding easier. So if any of those, particularly those that service underserved communities are interested in learning more, they can reach out to me. They can visit our website at theclearinghouse.org and we can get them on board. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Elena, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you for the invitation. I have loved being here. Absolutely. It's a great topic that I, you know, part of my mission is to give visibility to this. So having people like the Clearinghouse and you on the show really, I feel like helps get that message out that, you know, there's a lot the payments industry does, but there's also a lot more that the payment industry can do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Greg.
Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.